Welcome to another inspiring episode of the Happiness on Tap podcast. Today, we have a special guest who embodies the essence of holistic health and wellness. Dr. Rosie Benavides, affectionately known as Dr. Rosie. Dr. Rosie is not only a licensed and board certified doctor of, and I always struggle with this, <laughs> na rop Yep, nephropathy. <laughs> nephropathy. But also a dedicated lifelong learner and passionate healer. Join us as we dive into her incredible journey through the world of chronic pain management, pediatric care, and much more. Get ready to be empowered and rejuvenated as Dr. Rosie shares her wisdom and experience on how to achieve true wellness and take an active role in your recovery. Hello, and welcome back to the Happiness on Tap podcast, where guests dive deep into the vulnerable experiences that contribute to their happiness. I'm Leanne Heron, a certified health and life coach, owner of Finding Resilience with Leanne, and the creator and host of this podcast. Thank you for joining us for Holistic Healing, a journey to wellness with Dr. Rosie Benavides. Hello, Dr. Rosie. Thank you for joining me. How are you today? Hi, Leanne. Thank you so much for having me. I'm doing great. How are you? I am wonderful. I'm so excited for this conversation. So thank you again for agreeing to be on my show. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Great. Dr. Rosie Benavides, again, affectionately known as Dr. Rosie. I think that is great is a licensed and board certified doctor of nephropathy. She holds multiple degrees from CNM, UNM, 200 hours certified yoga instructor, and her earned her doctorate from the Southwest University of Naprothic. Naprothic. Thank you. <laughs> I should have you say the big words. Medicine in Santa Fe. <laughs> Dr. Rosie has experience in chronic pain and spine pathologies, pediatric care, geriatric care, and maternity care. She is fueled by her passion for understanding the nuances of human anatomy and how lifestyle affects pain and disease. Dr. Rosie hungers for knowledge and determination to turn information into action has contributed to her pursuit. She considers herself a forever student, eager to both build her academic foundations in chronic pain management and stay in tune with the latest evidence-based interventions and pain management. Dr. Rosie and her mother, Dr. Rhonda Benavides, have shared a dream of opening a wellness clinic since Rosie was 14 years old. Today, they operate a therapy clinic in Albuquerque, focusing on chronic and acute pain pathologies for patients of all ages. Their clinic, The Backbone, combines hand-on connective tissue manipulation therapy with therapeutic exercises and nutritional counseling to decrease pain and disability in the neuromusculoskeletal system. As open access providers, they welcome new patients without the need for a referral. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Dr. Rosie's holistic approach to healthcare empowers patients to actively participate in their recovery. Her dedication to ongoing research and professional development keeps her at the forefront of advancements in nephropathy. God, why does that word kill me? I can say it in my head, but I can't get it out. <laughs> Ensuring that her patients receive the highest standard of care. So Dr. Rosie, can you tell us just a little bit about what you do? Hi. <laughs> Okay. Okay. 
Yeah, so a little bit about what I do. Um, I feel like I do a little bit of everything uh, right now in my role, um, but primarily I treat pain. Um, and that can range from that strange pain in your pinky to chronic debilitating migraines. Um, so my mom and I co-own the backbone um, and we have a little bit of a division between our patients. So I primarily see children, uh, pregnant women, athletes, and Dr. Rhonda primarily focuses on geriatrics. Wonderful. Yeah. It's got to be exciting and interesting working with your mother. <laughs> yeah, it has its own challenges. <laughs> um, I think but, it's wonderful. Yeah, it's it's been a really, I can't imagine doing this with anybody else. That's wonderful. I love that part of it. Yeah. Okay. So Happiness on Tap's mission is to provide value to our listeners by providing tips and tools to help people realize they are not alone while providing education and information to help them improve their daily life and health, cope better with life's challenges, reduce stress, and become the best, most authentic version of themselves. So let's get started. Dr. Rosie, can you start by telling us a little about your background and what led you to pursue a career in this field? Yeah, so growing up, um, I've always been fascinated with the human body. Um, I've always loved bones, the TV show Bones and like actual human bones. So I thought from a very early age, I wanted to go into forensic anthropology. Um, I did a little bit of that in my undergrad and realized academia is not for me. Um, I'd much rather be doing um, than, than talking about it or, or researching, at least in this phase of my life. Um, so getting back to what led me into neuropathy, I started gymnastics at a very early age. I was 18 months, in fact, and spent so many years in PT, outpatient PT clinics, and I always got stronger. Um, PT really helped me get back to my sport. But one of the aspects that was never really addressed was my pain. Um, and so coming out of undergrad, I was kind of like, what am I doing with my life? Um, and I was looking back into PT school. And neuropathy actually fell into my mom's lap. And she asked me, hey, what do you think about this program for me? And I said, what do you think about it for me? <laughs> Um, and that's kind of how we, we started. Did you start the program at the same time together then? Yes. How exciting is that? Yes. So we went to school together. Uh, we did our four years up in Santa Fe. So. How exciting is that? Are you, is your office here in town? Right? Yes. Here in Albuquerque? Albuquerque? Yes. Okay. That's what I thought. Um, just real quick. Love Bones. That's, it's like an addiction of me. My husband, we watch it every day. Oh, yeah. Even if we've seen them, we watch them again. We talk about <laughs> it. You know, it's funny. I learn things and then I don't realize, oh, I heard that on bones. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. my grown up education. Oh, that's awesome. It's funny, like growing up watching it and then now like rewatching a lot of the episodes and being like, that's not the right way to refer to the body or like, that's a, <laughs> that's a very black and white way to think of the body. But Regardless, still a fabulous show. I love it. I watch it all the time too. <laughs> fabulous show. We love it. Okay. So you have such a diverse range of experience from chronic pain and spine pathologies to pediatric and maternity care. How do you integrate these different aspects into your practice? So I know you said you primarily work on athletes and women and kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so honestly, um, when we first started and through like our internship, I, I didn't get to have a choice of who I was treating and seeing. Um, and so being able to transition from working on like a two-year-old who has more somatic issues um, to like a 97-year-old who has had all their, all their joints replaced um, has really allowed me to offer this kind of treatment to all types of bodies. Um, and it really fuels my passion for, for validating people in their experience. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I love that. And yeah. I know that I had mentioned I had wanted to 
talk to you more about what you do on a personal level um, because my ex-husband had injured his back setting up pool tables for like 13 years and ended up having to go through pain management um, after, you know, extinguishing all his chiropractic and massage and all of that. He ended up with just pain management, which was just opiates. Oh. And unfortunately, it caused an opiate addiction. Um, but it's, you know, from what I'm understanding about what you do, I think if he had had, if we had had the knowledge for other options for alternative care or other types of practitioners um, that would do more of a, a whole body approach as well as taking that time, like you said, to validate people's experience, I think he may have had a different outcome. But yeah. we hit wall after wall after wall with pain management. You know, it got so bad that like I wasn't allowed to attend his appointments with him because my focus was, you know, help him so he can get off these meds so he can return to some kind of normal life. Um, and so I constantly was trying to learn and be educated to help him learn different exercises and different things he could do, different foods that we could try to alleviate the inflammation um, so that he wouldn't have to be on those meds. And eventually, I mean, they didn't want to hear anything I had to say or have me interfering in his treatment. So like I was banned and not allowed and I wasn't allowed to speak to his workers comp caseworker um so it really you know and it, eventually after eight years it ended my marriage because the addiction itself got so bad that it just was something I couldn't continue to live with and neither could my kids okay. um but like I said I think what you do it sounds like you're a different approach right absolutely and um I always throw caution to the wind, like opiates and um, medications exist for a reason. And they're, they're really great treatment when they're used properly um, and not the only option. Um, but I, I, I really feel for you because to have that experience and to go from advocating day in, day out for your husband and then to not even be welcome, that's, that's tremendously hard. And I, um, I can really appreciate where you're coming from with that. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I think too, what was frustrating for me was, and you know, maybe it's just the fact that he's a man and this is how he approached his care. But when he would go to the doctor and they'd say, okay, how are you doing? And his answer to everything was, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. And so if I was with him, I would speak up because the answer was not, he's fine. Like the mood swings, the agitation, the violent tendencies, the outbursts, the addiction was just horrifying and he wouldn't talk about it. Yeah. And so, you know, to some degree, I don't blame the doctors because he wasn't being honest. Yeah, that's fair. So um, to have somebody try to be there and say, no, this is really what's going on. I think, again, could have helped, but. Yeah. Um, I generally spend about an hour to an hour, 15 minutes with my patients when they first start coming in. Um, and I really, I really honed in on my detective skills. Um, and so when I, when I really get that strong sense that somebody isn't being honest with me, I try to come from a place of like, Hey, I can tell you're not feeling good. Um, like what's going I really try to like I tell people all the time I feel like I'm playing clue like who done it and where mm -hmm. um, and and for men particularly those first few visits are very I can tell are very uncomfortable for them they don't like to tell me everything which is fine I totally get that um but after a while it's like oh my gosh I've I've been telling you things I've never told another human being I'm like okay <laughs> <laughs> um but I I yeah, it's hard. And it's hard with our medical system. We don't have enough time with patients. Yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, you know, a reason why I'm trying to put all this together to help people find alternatives. So I look forward to having you on the next panel here as soon as possible. Yeah. Can you explain what 
is the difference between what it is you do and other forms of alternative medicine like chiropractic or physical therapy? Because you did have that physical therapy background as well. So sometimes I even get confused with what it is I do and how and really how is it different? Um, truthfully, I think the, the biggest difference between a napperpath, a chiropractor, a PT, or an osteopath is how we philosophically view the body. Um, so for us, we want to heal head to toe. Um, we want the engine running well, right? So we want our nutrition and, and our sleep and our stress very well managed. Um, and sometimes I think the word holistic is a little overdone, um, but we really try to be holistic um, in our treatment. So we do focus on manual therapy and adjustments like a chiropractor or a massage therapist may. We focus on a lot of the corrective exercise and um, home exercise programs that a PT does. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, though, we really try to hone in into what's causing dysfunction. Um, and that takes time. And that's why our visits are longer. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. And it is so important to see people as a whole body, mind, body, spirit, and get to that, the core of where these issues are coming from, because they all relate. You know, if, if you're not sleeping well, maybe it's some of it's the mattress and, you know, changing to a new mattress may help alleviate some of your pain. Um, if you're not getting the right nutrition or uh, enough hydration or any other forms of exercise, it, it you're missing all the pieces to make a person whole. So I really appreciate that what you do is trying to make that person whole and hear all those things. Right. Right. Yeah. And I, you know, growing up in the realm of, of PT, it was always very frustrating of like, well, we only have the referral for your ankle, right? And so for us, we've even gone, like I said, like you are so much more than a region of your body and your pain and your experience is so much more than a region of your body. I love it. I love it. I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting to know you better and more about you and more about your business. You. Your approach to healthcare really emphasizes this empowering patients to take an active role in their recovery. Can you share some strategies or practices that you do that to encourage patients to adopt these strategies? Yeah, so one of the biggest things that I try to focus on is shame reduction, guilt reduction. And that may sound a little funny coming from somebody in my field, um, but the way that we perceive either our injury or how we're taking care of ourselves is usually lesser. Like I, I hear all the time, like, oh, I didn't do my exercises. I'm so sorry. Or my stupid body just is always hurting. And Ooh, that's a lot, right? And that's a lot of barriers to healing and to recovery. So I like to really focus on giving my patients homework that is one to two, three, one to two things that they can integrate that week. Um, and a lot of times I'll say like my biggest ask is that you start talking to yourself a little bit nicely on the inside. Um and that, and from patient to patient, from body to body, that looks different. But I think focusing on more of, um, again, a holistic strategy to accomplishing uh, dysfunction reduction, injury prevention um, has been really successful for me. I believe it. I believe it because that is something, you know, as a life and health coach, that's one of our primary focuses is, you know, um, the mindset shifts and practicing mindfulness and practicing affirmations because you really have to shift that mindset to really be able to open the doors to do the work to achieve the goals 
for what they want to achieve. Because if they're still living in this either lack um, or a negative mindset, it's going to be a lot more difficult to help them achieve their goals until they can kind of, like you said, talk to themselves nicer um, and give themselves grace. I think that's one of, you know, the things that I always tell people, whether it's uh, grief or trauma or even career issues, what is just give yourself grace. Don't be another person that's beating yourself up. Right. Totally. So I love it. I love that you, that you do that. I think it's very beneficial and very helpful for people going forward with their care. Right. Thank you. And I always remind my patients, like I've been a patient. I know what it's like to be on the other side. I know how hard it is to do all the exercises. And I really understand that negative mindset. And I really try to, you won't get any judgment from me. You won't get any judgment if you didn't do your exercises, if you didn't listen to a single thing I said. Um, but but know that 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 part of ourself is stopping you from getting better. Absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> you describe yourself as a forever student. I am as well. I feel like I'm a lifetime learner. Um, how do you stay updated with the latest advancements in pain management? So um, I subscribe to a lot of journals. Um, I subscribe to PT, osteopathic, chiropractic, across the board, immunology. Um, I do a lot of continuing education, even if it doesn't count for my, for my license. Um, I probably do something every day. Um, and also like social media is a really great way to stay up to date. Um, there's a ton of pages and people that I follow on Instagram and TikTok. And I really like to see what people in other countries are doing. I of course do my own research, make sure everything is, um, evidence-based and fact checked. but I, I love living in this day and age of just constant information, constant building. Yeah, I agree. Technology is right at our fingertips and right in our ears and we can have it on the go. Um, and it is so valuable. I'm like you, I, I learn something new every day. Um, but that's kind of part of my routine, my morning routine, my daily routine. Um, I like to start my day off, um, you know, practicing gratitude before I even get out of bed in the morning. I put on my workout clothes. Um, when I'm working out, I'm listening to a podcast and it's always something that's in my niche, in my field. Um, but not always, you know, I follow a lot of people like you on, on YouTube and, um, you know, something will catch my attention about a guest that they'll have on their podcast where I'm like, Oh, I need to listen to this. And there's always something in there that you know, I always tell people, my podcasts pick me. I don't pick them. Like, I don't scroll looking for something. It usually just magically appears at the top of my list. And that's the one I need to listen to for the day. Um, and I take that information as part of my learning every day. But like you said, I also go back and do my research um, and, you know, make sure things are fact-based. I listen to a lot of Mel Robbins Um and, you know, just other other people kind of in this niche area of coaching. And so I'm like you, like it's very valuable to me to stay up to date all the time on what's going on in the world. And social media does help that. Yeah. Um, so how does your background as a certified yoga instructor influence your practice? Yeah, so truthfully, I, I think being not so much the yoga part of being a yoga instructor has influenced me more than being an instructor, being somebody in a place of power. Um, I started teaching yoga when I was 19 uh, in Albuquerque at a, at a studio that is now closed, but was very big at the time. And I was so not ready for some of those very raw experiences 
from a an older gentleman confiding in me that he was very suicidal and having a hard time to like an elderly lady farting in class. <laughs> I was really trying to like make sure I didn't laugh and give space. Um, but for me, I, I really want to thank the the women who owned that yoga studio and who helped me because in my practice, they taught me how to offer modifications, how to meet everybody where they're at, um, how to deal with grumpy people, uh, and, and really how to lead. I love it. I love it. And I started doing yoga as I was coming out of the marriage I was talking about. Um, and I did it one, just because I was seeking something to do outside of the home it would benefit me physically, emotionally, mentally. Um, but my big focus was on like improving my balance. Um, because I had always had, I, I was born with problems with my legs. So I always had real weak ankles and had really poor balance. Um, and so my focus was like on that part of yoga, on the stretches, on balance, on poses. At no time did a yoga instructor or anybody else talk to me about where my mind was during all of that. Yeah. Like the only part of my mind that was in it was if I breathe right, I can bend farther. Mm -hmm. If I breathe right, I can hold my balance longer, but nobody really talked to me about the mental side of it, you know? And so then when I was going through uh, PTSD and anxiety and panic in 2019 and 2020, and I was seeking help for brain fog, anxiety, depression, memory loss, all these things. I never, I didn't know at the time whether it was COVID menopause or PTSD, or if it was a combination of all three. Um, but I knew that I didn't like how I felt and that I wanted to get out of that dark space. And so I found meditation and it was just random. You know, it was just one of those magic things that appeared on my phone. And then I pulled it up on YouTube and taught myself from one minute to however long I could go, how to meditate. And that was the first time that I connected my mind to my body. Yeah. Um, so like, I, you know, I, I like what you're talking about and how you learned how to meet people there, how to help show them modifications. Um, but that would be, I think, a, a, a suggestion, you know, or just a thought that that was somewhere where I felt kind of lost. Like I was doing it. I kind of like told myself like for the wrong reasons, like I was doing it as an escape from my marriage. Yeah. Same thing with going to the gym. It was an escape from my marriage. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't until I was in a different place in life, a better place in life that I was able to take all of that knowledge and put it in a different perspective. Sure. Yeah. I, um, you know, I have always been very introspective of myself. I was a gymnast and I needed that mind body connection. And I think I found yoga for very, um, non yoga reasons as well. I was, you know, I thought that I would just look better and I would be so put together and very quickly realize like, no, this is at you actually get to see the other side of yourself in silence. And in, in doing so, I uh, I rebelled against uh, yoga when I first started teaching. I like started teaching and then I took a pretty good hiatus because I was so uncomfortable in myself. Um, and then when I was able to kindly finally come back to it, oh man, I just, so many different things, like the universe <laughs> opened up for me at that point, so... I, I agree with that story. I think things come at a time when they're meant to. Um, I appreciate all the all the steps along the way, 
but I like, you know, and, and I'm in my early fifties. So I've had a lot of experiences along the way. Um, but to now being able to look at them all from a completely different whole body experience on how I can also share that information and the things that I have learned with my clients. So it's not just, let me talk to you about creating a mindfulness practice or starting a meditation practice. Let me share with you how I got there and what I learned from it. So it's not just, you know, get on YouTube and watch a video that you may or may not ever connect with, but you may connect with my story and my experience and see it from yourself as a different perspective. Right. And I think that level of, of self vulnerability is so important as to hear as a, as a client, as a patient of not only am I not going through this alone, but somebody who has gone through it and has su successfully come out of it is standing right in front of me. And I think that is what makes some of the greatest providers um, that we have. Absolutely. So what are some common lifestyle factors that you observe <laughs> to significantly affect pain and disease? And how do you address these in your treatment plans? So, you know, I think the biggest thing that I see across the board is, is lack of movement. Um, I think that we are living in a time where fitness and diet is so popular that we almost build up these self-sabotaging behaviors that stop us from, from, and I don't want to say exercise, I want to say movement, um, because a lot of people kind of get stuck in this, well, I don't have my Apple Watch today to track it, so I'm not going to do it at all. Or um, like if it's not 10,000 steps, why should I do it? And just general movement across the board has significantly decreased, I think, for humans in the last hundred years. Um, so one of the biggest things that I recommend to my people is is just move. Um, I like to ask, like, what's your favorite what's your favorite physical thing to do? Well, I like to dance. It's like, okay, well, can you dance for two minutes? Just start with two minutes, and the next day, dance for two minutes again, and slowly work your way up to ten minutes, and if that feels good, to thirty. Um, exercise and movement don't have to be these really uncomfortable, hard workouts. It, it really is just moving more throughout the day. I agree. Um, I have what's called a movement menu that mm -hmm. I like to give my clients. I like to, like you said, avoid kind of the word exercise because that tends to be a block for people. Uh, but if I give them a movement menu and they start thinking about the things that maybe brought them joy as a kid that, that they have forgotten. Oh, that's fun. I can do that. You know, um, I met a lady who her background is astrology and hula hoops. Ooh. And she found a way to put those two things together to help awesome. people. And, um, you know, just taking time to find that joy in life. Um, I would much rather be out walking a neighborhood and taking that time to just be present with the sounds and the smells and the colors than inside a gym walking on a treadmill. Okay. Um, I see a lot of women on Instagram jumping rope, um, swimming, you know, is always a good exercise. Like you said, dancing, um, I told you a little bit about the cybersecurity guy that I interviewed. We talked a lot about VR. Yeah. And, you know, um, one of my good friends, that is part of her movement routine is to play on the VR. She can get her heart rate up twice as fast playing on the VR than she would if she was walking on a treadmill. And she enjoys it. Yes. And so... We've even had nights on like my Thursday night when I have my women's circle, well, she'll bring the VR and we'll hook it up to the TV I have in my office and we'll have a competition. We'll have a dance off. Um, and we laugh hysterically for, you know, two hours, just enjoying that movement together. That's awesome. I love that. So I agree. It is something that um, people are doing less and less of. 
So if we can find ways to get them to do more of it, they'll realize how much better they feel. Exactly. Exactly. It improves your mood. It improves your pain. It just does so much. So you talked a little bit about holistic health. For somebody who is new to that concept, um, what advice would you give to them to start their journey towards better health and wellness? Yeah, so I think it's one of the things that I, I would really like your listeners to, to leave with is that it's uncomfortable. It's hard work. It's not easy. It's not, um, it's not always like the self-care that we're being preached about on social media. Um, you go through the trenches when you're trying to, to really heal yourself. Um, and so I would say, start, start small and don't, don't give up when it starts to get tough. Great advice. Great advice. I know that'll be very valuable to my listeners because it is very difficult sometimes. Um, and you were talking about how people, you know, can use excuses like I don't have my Apple watch with me today. Um, I remember one day, and this was during my days again of escaping my marriage and going to the gym, but I had found this love for going to the gym. Like I could be there all day and be as happy as could be. And I remember getting there one day and, you know, pulling stuff out of my bag and I went to find my weightlifting gloves and they weren't in my bag. And I was like, oh, man, I should just, I don't know, just go home and tomorrow's another day. And then I was like, no, today's a great day to go buy a brand new pair of gloves. Yeah. <laughs> Drove from Belen to Las Lunas, bought a brand new pair of gloves and went right back to the gym and then got to enjoy my brand new pair of gloves. Yeah. Um, when, I think when you find the love for something that it brings you joy to do, that it's completely different. You know, it's not demotivating. You're not frustrated. You just find that joy every day. And it yeah. gives you a reason to keep coming back. Absolutely. And I used to have people that would come up to me in the gym and they're like, you're here every day and you're smiling and you're laughing and you look great and you're doing all these things. How, how do you get there? And I just like throw my arms and like, look, like you have everything you need here. You have great music. You have wonderful people who are here to support you and cheer you on. You have these cool, amazing toys and you have the ability to push yourself harder than you have ever pushed yourself before. And you get to see that you are capable and you can succeed. And it's not about, you know, having the biggest muscles or looking manly or it's none of that. It's just, man, I can run. I never yeah. ran before. Nobody's chasing me and I can run <laughs> and I can breathe and, you know, and I'm sleeping better and I feel great every day. And once you get all those endorphins, it's just, it's such a wonderful feeling. And so if you can just get past the start of it, yeah, um, the rest will come. Yeah, absolutely. There is a bit of drudging through the drudgery as uh, some other podcasts would call it. And, and I would also offer like, even when it feels good, even when you're feeling good, it it's still hard. It's still hard. Um, especially when it comes to pain, especially when it comes to, to managing pain. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what's next for you in your professional journey? Yeah. So this is kind of an interesting question for me. Um, <laughs> I, we opened the clinic when I was 24. Um, and so becoming clinical director, a doctor, a business owner is a little bit confusing as to what's next. <laughs> um, but really, I have so many big ideas for, for the backbone. Uh, one of the biggest hurdles that, that we're working through is, is getting insurance to cover us. Um, so my end goal would be that we are covered federally. 
Um, so Medicaid, uh, well, Medicare, and then also Medicaid would mm -hmm. be amazing. There's a lot of hurdles to go through for that. Um, and on a personal note, I, I've always wanted to be on a TED Talk or give a TED Talk. So that is something that I'm working to someday. <laughs> um, but as for the clinic, um, I, I would really love for our services to be accessible across the board. I think that's great. And I see you achieving that. Um, everything just takes time. Um, you know, being an entrepreneur in and of itself is a lot of work is. and figuring all that out and, you know, the marketing and the networking and social media and uh, websites and all that stuff. It just takes so much time. And so if you have the ability to have somebody help you with those things, that's great. But it, for me, it's it's just been kind of the the joy and the not joy of learning it. Yeah. Um, because there's always somebody out there offering their services to do it for you. But I am more, uh, I'm not, I won't say I'm a control freak, but I have always learned and taken pride in the things I learn um, and being well-rounded. And so, um, you know, like you, I'm always looking for ways to kind of get out of my comfort zone and learn more and do more and continue to share all of these wonderful people like you out with the rest of the world who just may not be aware of what's out there. Right. Right. So tell um, my listeners where they can find you. Yeah. So we have a small social media presence on Instagram, um, backbone.clinic. You can find us on Facebook at the Backbone Naprapathic Rehab Clinic. And then online at www.thebackboneclinic.com. Okay. I will make sure all of that information gets added to our show notes for our listeners so that they can find you. Um, I look forward to continuing to get to know you and work with you on some other projects coming up. We want to remind our listeners that the information provided in this podcast is for education and information purposes only. Um, I will make sure again to get her information out there so that you guys can find her here in Albuquerque, find her on all the socials, um, ask questions if you have them. That's how we become educated about our bodies. Um, and thank you so much, Dr. Rosie, for taking your time to talk to me about what it is that you do. Thank you so much for having me, Lan. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you.